And now, yeah, I used the same graphics I liked so much, but this is video online. Can you tell I did the graphic, the, the online part? It, lo it looks like my daughter just stamped it in. Um, well, anyhow, it looks like some five-year-old did it. She's 14, but whatever. Um, oh, I think Pauline, I think people are trying to come in. Anyhow. All right, give me one second. <laughs> yeah, I, just want, I just want Aaron here, because uh, I'm sure what he's going to share is going to be interesting as well. Um, anyhow. Bienvenue. Um, so sponsors, oh, that's just a slide I had, uh, I guess for sponsors. I'm sorry about the lack of pizza people. Um, I, I, I wish I could send it all to you, um, but uh, it, it is what it is. Uh, we do have a Slack channel. It's not being used as much as it should be, could be, would be. Um, I, I gotta say, I really enjoy, I've got a couple of Slack channels that I use within the community and they're great. I mean, you just have a question or, or have, you know, just a, you just want to say something and uh, um, it's been a real eye-opener. I'm, I'm, I'm actually copying from Slack channel to Slack channel now a lot of information because I think it's uh, great. So anyhow, we should be using it more. Uh, please sign up if you can. Um, okay, we do, have a, we do have social media. Announcements as well. I mean, we want to get back into the, the, the swing of things. So if you have a new meetup group, uh, a hackathon, a Kickstarter. Does anyone do Kickstarter anymore? Uh, maybe. Um, you know, uh, uh, conference courses, share it with me and we'll get it in front of everyone, okay? Oh, Aaron Hilton, we, are we on? Yeah, let me just, uh, uh, let me just get that to him. Pardon me for one second, guys. Uh, sorry, let me just share the thing with him. See, this is what happens when it's on the fly. Okay, so anything lately happened in the news? Kid Roxy, why don't you come here? I'd say a lot of good stuffs happened in the news. Uh, first off, the original iPhone SE, which I think is a pretty cool device for a starter device now. Um, budget four-inch iPhone uh, that was being discontinued in 2018 was revived in April uh, of this year with the new 4.7-inch model uh, that looks like an iPhone 8 with similar internals uh, to those of the iPhone 11, which is getting a lot of bang for your buck, I gotta say. It features an A13 Bionic chip, three gigabits of RAM, and a low price starting at $599 or $399 in the States, which is pretty amazing. Um, comes in a bunch of colors and uh, sizes of storage. I think this is a real winner because, um, well, I talk a little bit about how popular um, iOS and Apple devices are with teenagers. And this is just aimed right at them. And this is going to create that, that, you know, I start with this and I go into the deeper and deeper and deeper into the Apple universe. Uh, so I think this is really great. This thing is super sexy. I mean, I still can't see my iPad as a computer. My brother's been using it as a computer for a while. I have, I have the iPad Pro. I don't really like the current um, stand for it because I think it's awkward. But this beautiful thing where you've got that, that stand that just sits up there in the, in the, you know, in the air and it's just, it's, it's, it's sexy. I'm just going to call it what it is. It's sexy. Um, anyhow, so in Apple in March 2020 refreshed its iPad Pro lineup, introducing a faster A12Z Bionic processor, dual rear cameras, and LiDAR. Who saw LiDAR coming? I bet you Aaron saw LiDAR coming. Um, but the new LiDAR scanner for improved augmented reality capabilities, improved audio, and an optional magic keyboard accessory that adds a trackpad to the, future, to the iPad for the first time. Who has tried using the iPad with a mouse or a trackpad so far? Anyone? What's, I, I did for about five minutes. Sean, what was the experience? What did you think? Yeah, I found it a little bit uh, weird to do, um, not nearly as, as useful as I thought it would be. It's pretty foreign, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what it made me think about? Why the hell are Macs not touch friendly? It should be the opposite way. <laughs> like, make it that I could touch my Mac, not that I can Someday. use a house. Reddit, you had, you had experiences to share there? No, I was just saying someday they will be they'll have touch screen, but I guess the experience will be just like a MacBook, Mac OS. I, I would imagine. Um, oh, Paul, can, you, can you let him in? It says, can you let Aaron in? Oh, I already did. Aaron, are you in? 
Hello, I'm in. Okay, good. Yeah, hey, we, got, we, got, we got all the speakers here. The life is good. Ohio gets <laughs> I am ass. Uh, I'm kind of worried about us not picking up all the meetup group because that link I, I got off the meetup page. Oh, yeah, that might be an old bad one. That's why I emailed today. For security ah, okay. reasons, I didn't do it until just now. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, great to see you. Thank you for joining the fun. Let's good to be continue here. the mission. Um, so the Apple has designed a new magic keyboard for the 2020 iPad Pro, which is essentially a new version of the smart keyboard, but it's equipped with a trackpad. I mean, this thing looks like an iPad now. And I like this one because I grabbed the Arabic graphic, which I thought looked kind of cool. Um, so you got, now you got a, a trackpad, backlit keys, scissor switch mechanisms, um, and with a one millimeter of key travel. That is a word I use a lot, key travel. Um, and the full side magic keyboard attaches magnetically to the iPad Pro and features oh, can, cantilevered hinges. <laughs> of course, Cantile it's cantilevered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs> for smooth viewing, your smooth viewing pleasure, angle adjustments up to 130 degrees, uh, USB C pass through charging. Um, it's really cool. Like, it's, it's trying to be a computer now. Um, I hear it's also very heavy. Oh. I, I, I believe so. You know, I actually had neck problems. I think it's because I had the iPad Pro, the, uh, the, the other model, the big one, and it's holding up like this for long periods. It honestly does stretch your muscles. It's well, the, not natural. The case apparently weighs more than the actual iPad Pro. Really? Oh, Aaron, you got the new one? Yep, I got the new one. Oh, Mr. Fancy. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, but not the keyboard, no. This is no. just kind of one of the other generic cases that keeps it light. Ah. Oh. Mm. <laughs> um, so anyhow, the um, so uh, with the A12Z processor, the 2020 iPad Pro models uh, features up to 10 hours of battery life on a single charge. Pretty good. Pretty expected. Um, other iPad Pro features include Wi-Fi 6 support. Great if you got it. Uh, gigabit class LTE um, and uh, storage options ranging from 128 to 1 terabyte. Um, and as well as added five studio quality microphones to the iPad Pro for capturing super clean audio. And there's four speakers included for an immersive sound experience in any orientation, <laughs> just what you want. Um, I thought this was interesting again to see how small this device is, yet so big. Um, so both iPad Pros are just 5.9 millimeters thick. The 11 inch iPad Pro weighs in at 1.04 pounds and the 12.9 is at 1.41 pounds. So this is this is a pretty a powerful, small, big device. Does that make sense? Not too confusing. Um, mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in silver, or it's in silver and space gray aluminum, or for our British friends, aluminium. Aluminium. <laughs> there you go, yes. Um, and this is for what I think excites Aaron and all the other guys who are doing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the wonderful, uh, <laughs> um, stuff, LiDAR. So next to, the, oh, well, first off, the two cameras, the iPad square shaped camera bump. There's a new LiDAR scanner, so light detection and ranging that Apple says enables capabilities never before possible on any <laughs> device. I sound like jobs, right? Maybe not. Um, so the LiDAR scanner uses reflected light to measure the distance from the iPad Pro to surrounding objects that are up to five meters away, um, either indoors or outdoors, and the measurements are taken in at the photon level at nanosecond speed. Mm. Um, so the depth frameworks included in iPad OS combine depth points measured by the LiDAR scanner, data from the two cameras, the data from the motion sensor, and the computer vision algorithms handled by the A12Z Bionic to create a more detailed and complete understanding of a scene. So Apple says that the integration of all these elements enables a new class of augmented reality experiences on the iPad Pro, and existing um, AR kit apps will get instant AR placement, improved motion capture, and people occlusion, while developers can take advantage of the new scene geometry API that uses the LiDAR scan <laughs> scenarios never possible before. <laughs> One example of what can be done was demonstrated by a complete, uh, by complete anatomy. It's an app that is using the technology to measure the range of motion and people uh, healing from injuries. So it's pretty cool. I mean, Aaron, you've got experience using this now, I assume. Have you been pounding it? It's, it's a huge, you know, in kit. It's, it, it's light and day from the last one, or it's pretty much the same. It's such a fraud. No, and I tried it. The skeleton tracking is 
Nah. Really? <laughs> oh. oh, man. So it's like scary still. Connect has, has had this nails. Like, Microsoft's Connect has had this nailed a long time ago. Sorry yeah. to just, you know. But but the, it does so many other things spectacularly well. This is just one of those things I was like, I got to try this. But it didn't work out. So hey, that's too bad. That's too bad. <laughs> but I, I would like to tell you, say that, Aaron, you do have an Android phone now, too, right? Yeah. Actually, no, I still don't have an Android. <laughs> okay, I thought, and Aaron once gave me a hint that he was going to get an Android phone, so I was shocked to hear that. As, as the <laughs> fellow who ran this meetup group for a long time before me, mm -hmm. I thought that was violent. Just got a question for Aaron. definitely kept me in the fold. <laughs> I got a question for, to Aaron. Do you, Aaron, do you think that is uh, the shortcomings on the um, LiDAR there, is, is that a hardware? shortcoming or is it just the software? software? Keep in mind this is first generation of probably the software and the hardware. It's totally software. There's uh, some really okay. great revision algorithms that uh, without the help of a depth sensor can get better body tracking performance than what, what's uh, currently happening. And so uh, there's definitely a lot of like, they, they've got the capability the potential is all there. The sensor is fantastic, um, but uh, they just they just need to like better engineer. So, the, so that'll improve over network. time, then. I think so. Yeah, if they yeah. train with a neural network, uh, like you know what Microsoft pulled off, and they you know do the compression of the network and stuff, it'll it'll give spectacularly good skeletal tracking results. But right now it does a very poor job if there's any occlusion or if there's any side profile. So this way is okay, <laughs> but this way is not so good or any sort of abduction rotation thing. It doesn't pick that up at all. Oh, okay. If you say network, uh, it always requires an internet connection to do this kind of stuff? No, no, it'll do all of the processing on board. It's, it is really an impressive chip to, to do all the that neural core is very powerful. So um, it, it does not depend on the speed of the internet. No, no. It has the potential to do it. It is entirely a software problem. Uh, and I've seen, I've tried research papers that do a better job. <laughs> so, can, can you let them know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're I'm sure they're fighting their own battles. You know, this was a total surprise that they even launched this thing right now. Like yeah. I was expecting mm. the soonest would be WWDC. So I'm guessing Apple's got something else on their agenda. They needed this pushed out first. That's interesting. Uh, I have no idea. Well, it's good to hear because I'm thinking of getting one of these things. It's nice. It is nice. Do you have the 12, 12 inch or oh, the uh, 11 inch? I got the 12 inch. Go for eight. Yeah. Don't go small. Don't go small. <laughs> go big or go home, right? There you go, baby. There you go. <laughs> um, super. So who, this. Okay, I hate rumors. I almost never ever share rumors, but I thought this one's too believable not to be the way everything's going with the with the iOS world. So Apple's Xcode developer software, the rumor is it's embedded in iPad OS 14. Um, oh. And so the introduction of Xcode into iPad also opens up the possibility of pro class applications that would properly tap into the processing horsepower of the iPad Pro. So instead of, you know, just doing it virtually, Simulation. this is the mm. real thing. So. I mean, I can't see why it would be a problem. They're going to be moving to the ARM processors anyhow. You know, they're doing their own mm -hmm. processors. So the old thing, oh, it has to be on an Intel chip. Ah, that shouldn't matter. So this is, this is going to be cool. Um, so this shows how divided the world is still, okay? According to the data sourced by consumer research intelligence partners, Google's Android operating system was responsible for 56% of all activations uh, due to the higher number of Android smartphones out in the wild. But market share numbers for iOS and Android have la largely remained stable over the last course of a few years with minor um, fluctuations and activations due to operating system loyalty. And according to the data sourced from consumer resource intelligence partners, Google's Android operating system was responsible for 50... Oh, no, that's redundant. Pardon me. I hit copy twice. But let's oh. keep going. In the quarter ending in March, 89% of Android users remained with Android, while 91% with iOS. Okay, no big surprise. Um, um, when activating a new phone, but iOS and Android loyalty rates also fluctuated with a little course over the last three years, as people tend to stick with their operating systems. So there really is a down the middle line 
um, other things. It's quite interesting that way. Um, and so, so, the, I, so Chris, this is not including the right the current quarter, correct? No, this was this was um, the last quarter. So I'm wondering. I, this just makes me wonder: Will the quarantine affect that? Oh, I, would the lack of Apple stores affect that? I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's these numbers are going to be bizarre. You know. Yeah. These numbers are going to be very foreign. Um, so okay. We will see. We will see. Mm -hmm. um, so the iPhone continues to be the most popular smartphone among U.S. teens, though. And this is why I'm saying that the SE thing is such an interesting play. Okay. So this is a title that they've held for many years. But according to new data gathered from uh, Piper Sandler, um, in a, um, 85 percent of teens surveyed own an iPhone and 88 percent expect the iPhone to be their next phone. I mean, that's huge numbers for the teens. Um, and when you have a 599 or in the States, $399 device, that's a pretty good device available and one that has fingerprints. So you don't have to uh, use the face because that thing doesn't work with my mask. I'll tell you. Yeah, it doesn't work at all. Um, that's a sexy device, you know. Uh, so I think Apple really understands that in order to, they need to get people that are young that get into their, you know, their, the, the whole ecosystem, the whole, yeah, the mm -hmm. whole caboodle, and then they upgrade and upgrade and upgrade in. And it's, it's a great path, I gotta say. Apple's figured this out. Um, also, Apple's developing a new feature that allow users to interact with select content and experiences and third party apps without needing to have the apps installed which is, um, this is what they're, they're trying for iOS 14, which is interesting. So the report claims a new API referred to as Clips in iOS 14 code will enable users to scan a QR code linked to an app and then interact with content from the app via a floating card in the screen. The card would display options to download the full version of the app from the App Store or to open the content if the app's already installed. Android already has something similar, it's called Slices, but you know, because it's Apple, it's new. <laughs> Yeah, um, slices. Um, how slices is done is they use um, um, or they're a UI template that can um, um, display rich, dynamic, and interactive content from your app from within the Google Search app, and later in other places like Google Assistant. Slices can help users pl uh, perform tasks faster. Um, and Apple, um, so so Apple's basically following suit. But Apple said to be testing this feature already with OpenTable, Yelp, DoorDash, YouTube and Sony's PS4 as a second screen app. I, and I think it's really cool. Um, you know, this is for marketing and for just getting people to download your, your app. This is a, a very cool opportunity. Um, anyone ever do any health apps? I mean, we've done a couple, you guys, yeah? So mm -hmm. Apple, of course, restricts quite a few things in this, um, but something that just happened, which is interesting, is Apple informed developers that it's released in its updated um, human interface guidelines for HealthKit uh, guidelines on how to use the Apple Health app icon. So you can start using it now. You weren't allowed to use it before. Um, as well as other terms and a new privacy, G, uh, privacy and data usage guidelines. So now you're able to use the Apple, hap, the Apple, the Apple Health, oh, I need a drink, uh, icon to promote their apps. And unsurprisingly, there is a lot of guidelines for developers in order to use it. So don't think you can just do it. Make sure you follow you know, you, you tow the Apple line. Um, didn't see this coming, but this is, this is of course, obviously fascinating with uh, uh, what the world is gonna be needing. Uh, so um, on April 10th, Google and Apple announced a partnership uh, that will see the two companies developing a Bluetooth-based smartphone tracking solution that allows governments and health agencies to reduce the spread of coronavirus, coronavirus while also protecting user privacy. Now, the, the user privacy is really interesting here, but. The whole idea is, yeah, you could use, say, for example, TELUS, um, and I just happen to be talking to TELUS Health, so I, I know very well that they're looking at doing this, um, but you don't have true location when you're using triangulation, but when you're using a PicoNet of Bluetooth, you can actually tell who has been in your network and who's crossed paths. So this is something that really could help with the tracing um, of the virus. So in the coming months, um, Apple and Google will work to enable a broader Bluetooth-based contract tracing platform by building this functionality into their underlying platform itself. So Apple will says the solution is more robust than the API, which is actually coming out in a couple of days. Um, but this will actually be part baked into the operating system and allow more individuals to participate in if they choose to opt in. And this is the problem, you still have to opt in, which, you know, you need the numbers I, I, I read today needs to be at least 60% in order to statistically mm. start figuring out things. Good luck getting 60% of the people to opt in. This is something that should be mandated. Um, as far as I'm concerned, but then I'm not a libertarian. Um, 
And Apple's, um, so if you choose to opt in, um, so this will work by a random rotating identifier being assigned to a person's phone and transmitted via the Bluetooth to uh, other nearby uh, devices. The identifier, which rotates every 15 minutes and has no personally identifiable information, will pass through a relay server that can then be run by world, uh, health organizations worldwide. The list of identifiers, uh, or the list identifies a person who's been in contact with, uh, doesn't leave the phone unless the user explicitly decides to share it. So none of that information leaves it unless it's shared, which again, a little bit limiting. Um, so users that test positive will not be identified to the other users, Apple or Google. So you won't actually be able to know, but that gets through. And as well, if you do identify yourself as saying I'm positive for COVID, you actually have to pass a whole bunch of tests. So you can't just, and I don't mean tests like COVID tests, like prove that that's you, because I don't want people just to start saying it, you know, giving, giving COVID uh, scares to everyone because that defeats the whole purpose. Um, but all identification matching is done on device. That's the big thing, on device. It's not sent out. Um, allowing a user to see within a 14-day window whether their iPhone or Android device has been near the device of a person who's self-identified as having tested positive for COVID-19. Users who are notified um, that they've been exposed will then receive steps on what to do through a public health app. Apple and Google are not using location data for tracking um, for the tracking feature, including the users who report being positive. This tool is meant to determine not where affected people have been, but rather if or that they've been around other people who have been exposed so that they can go and self-isolate. This will have a verification flow, meaning that users will be required to submit proof. Yeah, like I said. So this is on device, on device, not centrally server, and not actually identifying location. So your privacy is well met. I still think it's a it's a kind of a 45% of the way option, but at least it's going in the right way. And I know that the um, the uh, NHS from the UK has um, started working on this. And I can't say officially, but I know there's certain groups here that have because we've been talking to them. So we we are we're, companies are looking at this thing right now. Okay, big ones. Mm. Um, but what's interesting, I don't know if you heard with France, for example, France came out with its own, it said we want to track it. So France has asked Apple to remove a Bluetooth limitation that it claims is delaying the launch of their uh, designed app, government designed app for contracting, um, for contact tracing. But the solution takes advantage of a decentralized API, so it'll give the user's um, position. And France says, no, we won't do this. But this is, or sorry, Apple says they won't do it, they won't allow it. But this is super interesting legally because an American company that's a multinational is saying, no, we won't allow a government to do what they need to do to keep their people healthy because we know better than the government. Oh. That's, that's a, I mean, it's a slippery slope for giving the information and it's a slippery slope when you say, no, we supersede the powers of the government. That's really, really spooky that these companies are that powerful. And I love this picture. No. <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> um, oh, this is cool. Um, so I don't know if you guys seen it, but Apple is reorganized thing. We're recognizing that you need to reorganize your life. So now when you do a search, the nearby searches are groceries, food delivery, pharmacies, hospitals, urgent care, shopping centers, pretty far down the line now for obvious reasons. I bet you movies don't even show up. Um, and Google's been doing this too. And actually I would even say Google's doing a little bit better because they're even giving like what's open and what's not open. And it's, I've been using that one a lot. It's been really powerful, but it's, but it's interesting how dynamically these things change, you know? And it hmm. almost becomes to the point that we don't notice they've changed. It just, it's just matter of fact. It, 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 does that improve our lives? Yeah, I'd say it probably does. You know, you don't get stressed out getting the, the, the I really want to go to a shopping mall. God knows I love shopping malls, but you know. <laughs> It, 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 it's, it's delivering the content that we need in a, in a, safe, in a safe way. Um, Apple announced as well that it's partnering with its RED program uh, to direct 100% of its eligible proceeds uh, from its product RED products to the Global Fund's newly established uh, COVID-19 response mechanism through September 30th. So Apple says that the uh, response mechanism will provide critical support in countries with health systems most, threat uh, most threatened by outbreak and in turn help preserving life-saving HIV and AIDS programs in Sub-Saharan Africa that red proceeds usually go towards. So the funds will go towards personal protective equipment in these countries, um, like mass diagnostics, all of these things. So, I mean, you know what? 
that's awesome. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to say AIDS is a, you know, is a solved problem. It's definitely getting a lot closer, but again, it shows that this is a priority and, you know, Apple is trying to do what they can to direct the funds that way. So good on them. Um, well, this was kind of cool. I don't know. If, so for Apple in uh, March, it released a version 13.4 of the software designed for the HomePod. And um, it's actually, it flipped. So now the HomePod code says that um, it's using tvOS version of iOS. Um, hmm. So before it was using um, an operating system closer to the iPad um, on iPhones, but now it's its own derived tvOS um, operating system. I just hope it improves, to be honest. I've got one of these things. I've had it for two years. Mm. I have such a love-hate relationship with the HomePod um, because it just, serious, just so bad. I can't believe how often I ask for it to place one song or my kids ask, and it just plays a gangster rapping song that swears so much. And it's like, how is this happening every time? It's not mm. even close to what I said. So, um, Improve this stuff, Apple. Come on. I wonder if, uh, with the addition of TVOS, if they're planning on having a screen version of uh, HomePod. That makes a lot of sense. That's that's a really good thought there, Lo. You know, honestly, like as a as a Apple guy through and through with most of my devices and so on, uh, I use Google Home, and, mm -hmm. um, and the amount of integration with like my Sonos and my Philips lights and my key lock my door lock and everything like that just uh until apple gets their act together in this i don't see any way of of using siri for these uh these things and, and totally agree yeah totally agree yeah. it is interesting uh apple did acquire a television company from germany a while back so they've got all the ip and all the smarts originally <laughs> so and it, you know, they might actually come out with a TV sometime. Jeez, well, a German TV is already going to cost you $25,000. So why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not? <laughs> That's right up Ali's, or Apple's alley. Um, and um, five months after launching, with millions of people stuck at home, Disney's streaming service, Disney Plus, is now already reached 50 million subscribers, <laughs> which is incredible which is honestly incredible. So Disney Plus in early February had 28.6 million. So it doubled almost in one month. Um, in, oh, sorry, in the last two months, I guess it's April. Um, so much of this boost could be attributed to recent launches of you know, the service being now in UK, Ireland, Germany, Italy, Spain, Austria, France, Switzerland, and India. But 50 million subscribers is like months ahead of their own schedule of where they thought they'd be. And I got to say, they've done a great job. Their content's good. My kids like it. I, I got to watch the Shaggy DA, DA, which takes me back to 1974. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dave, you know what I'm talking about. You like that one. <laughs> it scared me as a kid, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's cool. So, eye candy. We are lucky today to have Alexi show us about Screen Badge. So, I am going to stop sharing my screen, if I can. Uh, if I can, pause share. How do I stop share? Uh, first, it doesn't show the. Sorry, just bear with me here. When you do, when you do a um, keynote, just something so you guys know. When you do a keynote with Zoom, they basically want to fight with each other as to <sighs> which you know swallows the events, and they do not like playing with each other. I think Zoom, Apple should just buy Zoom. There you go. Um, so Alexi, uh, yeah. um, do you, let me see, do you have the ability to take the conch? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I hope so. Um, Gives you the show screen option? Uh, I don't, uh, it should automatically switch when I speak, no? No, you need to, at the bottom it says uh, uh, share screen. Do you see that? Oh, to share my screen. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to share my screen. Just need to see uh, my uh, my my wonderful face. That's fine then. Let's That's fine. let's go then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so here we are in a uh, um, a new world order uh, defined <laughs> by coronavirus, and uh, and it's uh, it's changing a lot of different business practices. Some big, some small. 
and um, and and one in particular is uh, the ability to exchange business cards and uh, share contact information. And so um, this has been an area that I've been interested in for a while. And I thought, geez, you know, how, what can we do now that we're not like meeting face to face? Is there a way to easily, you know, share contact information as easy as a business card? And so, um, so I've developed an app called Screen Badge and uh, I was hoping to have a beta ready for everybody to try tonight, but it hasn't been released yet. So mm. uh, hopefully in the next day or two, you can download a, a beta version and try it out. And basically what the app does is it allows you to create a virtual background with a QR code up in the corner of the screen. And so with your QR code scanner or just the camera app, you can scan this and get my contact information. Uh, you'll have my contact information embedded in there is a link to uh, the beta app when it becomes available. And uh, I just thought this might be an easy way for people to network online through Zoom using virtual backgrounds. So yeah, I see David's already got it. And Trying it. so that's great. Um, so try it out and it's kind of a reverse demo. I don't have anything to do. It's all up to you. Just scan that code. So you just put your phone at it and, and then I get your contact stuff. Yeah. It cool. just, uh, yeah, you should be able to mm -hmm. scan it. And i um, always curious with, you know, if it's going to be large enough. Yeah. I'm getting a lot of people that are able to scan it. One of the things that I've, I've got to report a, a bug with Apple. If you actually, once you get that contact information, if you don't go in the share icon at the very top, right and then say save to contacts you actually won't it won't save it so if you get it and then you just hit done it's just gone so which is not how it worked in ios 12 so <laughs> um, i'm hoping i can get apple's attention before um uh, they freeze ios 13. but um but please uh um, um you know try it out uh, email me with feedback. I, I'd love to hear what you guys think of it. If you think it's useful, if you like it, and what might make it better. So thank you. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Does anyone have any questions at all? No. Well, it's, it's you know it's it, a cool it, idea. It, it's simple. I like the simplicity yeah. of it. Uh, one thing. Yeah, that, nice. It's well executed. Me and a, and a friend were talking about something not like this. This is a very different application, uh, but uh, the idea of, you know, if you're sharing digitally, um, being able to see not just uh, like how you are connected, like on LinkedIn and so on, but also how, um, you know, if you're, for example, looking for, let's say you're a, um, starting a, a business where you want to manufacture clothing and you happen to connect with somebody and they have some contacts who are in that clothing um, uh, in the clothing manufacturing industry that they could uh, introduce you to that it you know lets you know that these are the types of people that this person could introduce you to or have as as contacts so at least then maybe gives you some context as to not just when you um, met but uh, also uh, how you guys can can your relationship can be beneficial to each other. Because um, a lot of the times when I get a, a business card from somebody, I know that they work at this company, but I don't know that they also have a, a history in this particular area um, and, and that might be useful and they don't know those things about me and how we could mutually um, have a beneficial relationship. Very cool, very cool. Any, any, any questions at all with that? Very simple, I mean, I love simple. You know, it takes me back to the original apps that just did one thing and did one thing well. You know, that's, that's the way it should be. Exactly. So uh, get my contact information from up here. And uh, if you need help uh, downloading the beta when it's available, just uh, email me and I'll get you set up. Very cool. Very cool. Well, so it's not in the app store yet, is it? No, no. It's just uh, I'd want to do some beta testing first to okay. uh, see what people think. Very cool. I, I, I got to say as well, I like all these virtual backgrounds. That's actually, for me, that's my first offices 
background. This is actually what I looked at every day. And it makes me feel kind of cool. And this is the reason why we kept saying, do we work at a software firm or a children's, uh, you know, dormitory? <laughs> um, and I mean, I'm looking at Pierre Jean. Uh, you, you, so the, I'm assuming that's got to be Korea. Because I actually spent an entire summer, my wife's, yeah, my wife's Korean. And um, her family has kind of an interesting history. And so that type of compound like that, they have 13 in their family. So I got to spend an entire summer in one of those that was like 800 years old. It was so cool. Like, you know, had the old, had the old uh, rice patties all the way around it and everything. I started fireworks while drinking and put some on fire, which made me really popular with the neighbors. Um, <laughs> but uh, they were even more freaked out when they came to tell me to be quiet and they realized I wasn't Korean. Um, yeah, anyhow, uh, I, love, I love the virtual backgrounds, they're fun. Oh, exactly. <laughs> Background, this one, background, nice days. This is very Canadian, you know. That, it's like having a bag, a bag of milk. Um, <laughs> super. Well, we are really lucky today to have three fantastic speakers. And um, we are going to start off the fun. I haven't actually told them what the order is, but I have here saying Sean uh, Bowles, who uh, is going to talk to us. Well, I'm, I'm going to say about Spirit's product pivot in the times of COVID, but there might be a slight different um, title to that now. But Sean, can you uh, take over, uh, take the conch, and uh, show us some uh, show us some love? Sure, fantastic. Thank you. There we right. go. You guys can see my screen, right? Yep. Spirit. Yeah. So, so what uh, I'm going to be talking about today is an app uh, that we're calling Spirits. Um, and how we ended up having to pivot our app uh, in the face of, of COVID-19 and, and what had happened, uh, what has been happening or is happening in the world, and, and, um, and really just uh, talking a little bit about, you know, being adapted or adapting to, to these changing times, uh, which we don't know at this point in time what normal is going to be when this is all said and done. Um, so... I'll, I'll just, you know, really quickly, the agenda for today, for what I'm going to talk about, we'll go over the idea, uh, how we decided to pivot it, and then I just have a quick note to another uh, small project that we are working on, uh, me and another friend, so um, that is very topical for right now. So uh, Spirits, the idea originally uh, that we started working on back in January was an app uh, that would be for uh, basically, a cocktail, uh, a social network for cocktail lovers, and um, you know, and bars, restaurants, um, and and you would be able to go out and find the best cocktails around your city, um, and especially you know things like, uh, for example, there's a, a bar really close by, or used to be close by to where I live, um, that was called Juniper, that had these great gin cocktails, and if you wanted to find the best gin cocktail in the city where would you go for, for that specific need? Um, and, and that was kind of the idea behind it. And, and then also being able to find bartenders and, and so on. And you know, one bartender leaves a, a bar that you love and goes to a new one and where did they go? And you want to still you know, see what they're doing and, and, and uh, what type of drinks they have on offer at this new place. Um, so a lot of what you're going to see is mock-up uh, work um, throughout this one. You know, we did a lot of, of, of wireframing in the beginning, but as you can see, it was really focused on an idea where you, you had a map that showed different bars and restaurants, um, some being uh, uh, generated by users, some being generated by the actual bars and restaurants and taken over. Um, but you know, being able to explore your city or, or a city that you're visiting and find these places where you can get great cocktails. Um, and, then, and then through that you know, user-generated and location-generated content, you'd be able to see okay, what is on the menu, uh, what, uh, what, uh, how are these drinks rated, depending on what types of drinks that you, you like. So for example, if you're a, a whiskey drinker or like, or like scotch-based uh, or whiskey-based cocktails, uh, being able to be recommended uh, when you walk into a location, what are the drinks that you might be interested in based on the past of, 
your your history of drinks that you've checked in and that you've liked or rated highly. Uh, and then and then being able to see you know other people who have taken you know, photos of the various drinks that they've had there, how they've maybe changed them. So oh, I really liked um, this um, Aviator, but having it made without uh, the um, what was it, creme de uh, violette instead doing it this way uh, and, and you know, getting ideas for how to, to try different things or what somebody does in a, in a specific way um, that you wouldn't necessarily be used to because you've never had it before. Uh, and then, um, you know, as you can see, then users would just check in a drink. Um, so in this case, uh, Islay Blossom at this place called Juniper. The ingredients are already there if they've decided to make a change to the ingredients um, because they decided instead of sap Bombay Sapphire, they wanted Hendrix or something like that, then they could make those changes and it wouldn't change the actual menu, it would just change what um, your particular check-in, uh, what variation you checked in at that point in time. Uh, and then how that maybe affected whether you liked the drink or didn't like the drink. And then of course, COVID-19 happened <laughs> and uh, we had to rethink this entire model for this app after all the work we had done already on development and getting ready to, to put it into beta and start testing it. Uh, we realized that we couldn't go anywhere and we couldn't, <laughs> no bars will be open, we don't know when they'll be open again. Um, and so we started to think, well, how can we change uh, this idea without losing everything that we've already worked on? And so this is where it kind of came down to where we sat down and said, what's the challenge right now? And the challenge obviously is that uh, we created an idea that was that centered around going out and, and uh, being social with people at bars, at restaurants, at pubs, and so on and so forth. And, um, and that was no longer going to be something that we could do. Um, but what we started to notice almost immediately is that uh, people are resourceful and they started to try and find ways to do the same things that they were doing out when they were going out at home. So if you were a cocktail lover like myself, uh, you started to invest in and buy the things that you need to be able to make the cocktails that you love at home. We decided to learn how to, to make a, an aviator or a really good old fashioned or, or yeah, some other new types of drinks that you didn't even know uh, necessarily existed. And so that's basically how we decided to pivot the app to be more of a social at home at the moment anyways, at home drinking application where you can create a, a drink um, and add a recipe for that drink and share that amongst your network and, and other people who are using the app and find ideas for new things to try um, and, and while you're at home. Uh, and eventually, hopefully new things to try when you're able to go out and, and be in public again. <laughs> Um, so yeah, as I said, the, the behavior we noticed, people wanted to learn new things uh, and they want to replicate the experience of going out. And so that's where we started to focus more on, on creating an actual drink in the app versus just going and finding drinks that you can uh, check in when you're at a restaurant. And then uh, really focusing on the photography and, and sharing and being creative while you are, are um, you know, making those, those drinks at home um, and, and your variations on recipes, remixing is what we like to call versus reposting or, or uh, retweeting, remixing somebody else's drink to, to show how you would make it and, and, uh, and, and re, you know, what your variation would be on it. Um, and so in the past uh, five weeks, we've gone from an app that we were almost ready to go into to beta with, um, with people out and about and having fun and testing it in bars, uh, to an app that um, it, we are now currently in a private beta 
with for testing um, and, and making drinks at home uh, as your own bartender. <laughs> uh, any questions on that? You, you mentioned um, you, you were, there was a lot more emphasis on sharing. And mm -hmm. it looks like the, the sharing is, uh, is, is still, well, it's obviously the recipes, which, which is really cool because obviously since they've become, uh, you know, I, I would imagine you could, if you wanted to double recipes or that, that would be fairly trivial because you have all that data is, is all, it's not just a blob of text. Um, but the other thing I wonder is, I, I, you know, just recently a lot of stuff has gone viral about people actually doing videos of, of making cocktails. If you thought, are, are video clips, Something you want want have this? I mean, Stanley Tucci apparently just made went hugely viral with his his uh, his cocktail uh, uh, video. Yeah, so I mean, one of the one of the first uh, features when we we got into starting to plan for for features down the road that we wanted to to think about adding was uh, the ability to add in a, a link. Uh, to uh, say, for example, YouTube or mm -hmm. or Vimeo video of, of how to make your drink, especially for those content creators out there to be able to to show you know here is the the old fashioned, but here's the here's and we can give you some you know these are the ingredients you need and here's the the notes on how to make it, but let me show you how to really make it. Let me show you. Um, yeah, like how do you burn the orange rind or whatever? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you, you know, <laughs> um, and, and that kind of like really uh, specific way of, of being able to, to share your content with people who are interested in it is yeah, it's definitely something that is on the list for us to, to add in. Very cool, very cool. Any other questions? Yeah, actually I have a question. Just wonder like how big is the team who worked on the app and uh, just like what, what do you use for your backend stuff? Is it just based on like some sort of AWS or Firebase or can yeah. you give? So um, it's two of us um, <laughs> as usual with every, pro with every project that I, uh, that I work on. It's myself and my, my business partner, Jackson. We like to, to just come up with ideas and, and see how they stick to the wall. Um, and uh, so I do the design, he does the development and it, and it seems to work for the two of us. Um, everything is built in, right now I think it's Kotlin um, is, uh, and um, yeah, he, <laughs> if you want to know more about like, what he's done on the back end for it, um, I'd be happy to answer some questions. For you, we have a, a URL up, which is spirits.app, um, just as it's spelled, spirits.app. Um, and uh, yeah, anything, he, he can give you more details on what he's done on the development side. Um, we are, uh, everything is going to be, is native. Uh, he's, a, he's a native iOS guy, and, and we're going to be building out the, the Android app once we, now that we're kind of into this private beta. Um, we're getting started on that side of the development, um, but uh, yeah. So the uh, authentication happens, as I saw on the first sl uh, slide, um, through Apple accounts only. So they can't create. We do. We have um, Apple ID for like sign with Apple ID, and then also email authentication. So email authentication. So uh, if they mention an email, you will send a verification link and yeah. then you, uh, then they will set up a password as well? No password. No password. So, Interesting. Uh, for, for example, you would you put in your email address, uh, we'll send you an email with a, with a button in it and then that will authenticate you and log you into the app, uh, into your okay. account or um, if the button uh, doesn't happen to work or you're not on you received the email on your desktop, for example. Uh, there's also a, a temporary code that uh, you can input uh, the same way you would with like a multi-factor authentication. Um, and, and then that will log you in. So if you want to log out, you simply remove the email from the app? Uh, we, we just have a logout button the same way. Uh, but yeah, essentially you just... And, and if they want to log in again, you will send another link to the email. Yeah. Okay. Each time they log in, you send an email. And uh, you store data, like pictures, 
um, in some centralized database or only on devices? Uh, the pictures are, I believe, are, we're using uh, like an S3 bucket on uh, okay. AWS. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and anything else? Any other questions, guys? One quick thing. I went to the website and put a name in to sign up for Learn More, and it looks like something is uh, uh, not quite working right now. I just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> I, will, I will take a look at that. I, I yeah. built the, the site really relatively quickly on uh, oh, okay. on uh, Webflow. And uh, so, yeah, we haven't actually even had a chance to test that out yet. Private okay. beta. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> early days, my friends, early days. But this is really cool. Any any other questions? No? Yes? Hey, Sean, very cool. I mean, oh, yeah, I know you got more to share. Pardon me. Yeah. I know this too. I'm going to shut up. It's the hard. last thing that was just a little uh, private note, um, being that what is going on with the world right now, me and uh, a friend, we put together this site called Got My City, which is just gotmy.city where um, you know if you are local to Vancouver and we also have some locations in Seattle you can find local businesses to support who are still open and operating um, if you have a local nice. business offerings you can put them up on the site as well um, and uh, we are actually in the we're, we're still expanding this to add more functionality and whatnot so this is completely uh, free always will be um, and, and, it, and we're always looking for people who may be interested in helping out the next thing that we're building is a is a web app for uh, for getting line wait times so that's one of the new realities is everywhere you go you need to line up you don't know necessarily what the longest or what the time is going to be when you get there so so we're building in a, a little web app that will allow people to um, crowdsource uh, information about wait times at various uh, grocery stores and other places but you know if you're interested in finding local businesses to, to support check out the site if you're interested in potentially getting involved in helping out um, because you want to help give back we'll, you know just reach out to us on the site and, and we're sure we'll find something for you to do that's fantastic great work for getting that up so quickly too thank you well, good stuff. Well, uh, virtual claps to everyone's muted, but anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll give my clap. Sean, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, always, always great stuff. Oh, there we go. You got the actual claps. Nice work, guys. Um, so fantastic. Thank you. Um, so um, after that, uh, we are blessed uh, with uh, Leonoid, um, or Leonid, pardon me, to, uh, to share. Uh, um, oh, I don't have it open right now. It was... Uh, it was a very nerdy, a nerdy topic, which I was looking very forward to. So, Leonard, did you want to take over? Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just share my screen first. Perfect. You're not in San Francisco, are you? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, who knows? <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, Excellent. Let me just, well, you've got uh, the conch. Pajasta. Спасибо. <laughs> Okay, um, so hi everyone. I'm going to actually talk a little bit more about the uh, technical topic, uh, specifically about uh, reactive programming, a little bit more with the context of uh, Swift Combine uh, framework. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's start. Uh, just a few words about myself. Um, so I'm a software engineer with uh, some plus years of experience. I worked for uh, different uh, companies such as uh, Intel, um, uh, Fortinet, uh, Rivian, actually my current place, we do um, sort of uh, Tesla uh, killer <laughs> uh, automobiles. So I also worked for uh, Logitech as a contractor for some uh, projects, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the uh, work experience related to uh, uh, reactive programming, I, I used it on a bunch of uh, different pro projects specifically um, at Intel, we had uh, AR glasses that we worked on and uh, we had a cool controlling uh, app uh, for the AR glasses. So um, I got some um, hands-on experience with the specifically React, Reactive Swift and uh, Reactive Coca. Uh, then I transitioned to uh, Fortinet and we had some of the uh, kind of custom uh, Reactive uh, solutions built. 
And uh, now I'm at Trivian and we actually started to use uh, Combine. Uh, so that's, uh, I'll, go, I'll go over that a little bit uh, later uh, in the slides. So just to kind of give a little bit of introduction of uh, what is reactive programming. So uh, let's see. So yeah, basically you can think, think of uh, reactive programming is uh, some sort of programming with the asynchronous data streams. So by asynchronous, uh, what I mean is there is a function that you register for a specific data stream that gets triggered whenever there is an event on that stream. And uh, in this uh, case, the stream actually means a uh, sequence of uh, events. You can think of event uh, as something like uh, pretty much anything. It can be uh, click, it can be uh, touch on the screen, it can be any data event, uh, such as, uh, I don't know, response uh, from URL session, or uh, there is some BLE advertisement packet received on the phone or something like that. Uh, yeah, um, let's actually check, uh, like just to kind of understand what the stream of values looks like. So you, you, you see uh, basically the events here represented with different colors. As I mentioned, uh, it can be pretty much any type of thing like variable change or um, uh, I don't know, state change, uh, any notification. Uh, so you can think of uh, each, each one as one single um, event posted over time. Uh, also, there is uh, some uh, type of error and completion. So if there is error or completion on their uh, on the channel, then pretty much uh, the whole uh, stream gets uh, terminated at that at that point. Uh, let's uh, actually talk a little bit more uh, with the, let's talk a little bit more about reactive operators. Uh, what is that and uh, why do we need it? So like, if you think about it, just re having reactive streams is not really helpful. But uh, so the actual kind of guts of reactive programming is about uh, combining it, doing something with those streams. So let's actually walk through some of the uh, operators examples, uh, just in general. So you, you probably know about map uh, function in different program, programming languages. So what map actually does, it, um, it takes the stream and uh, it applies some function to each of the value on the stream and it produces another stream. So Let's call that another stream as uh, downstream and the original stream, stream as upstream. So you can see here uh, that in the upstream, we get some uh, integer values, just numbers basically. And we have the map function that transforms our events, which are values, uh, uh, just multiplies it by 10. So you can see that the result downstream, uh, downstream uh, would be just 10, 20, and 30 for each of the input uh, value. And basically you can combine those and do anything else you want. Let's actually just, I think there is problem with this slide. Oh, okay. Uh, filter operator. So filter just allows you to uh, filter events uh, within the stream. So you, you, you can specify the condition that just returns uh, true or false. If it's true, then the event is passed down, uh, downstream, otherwise it just ignored. Uh, or silenced. Uh, some other cool operators that I, I'm thinking about, like a very useful usually is uh, something like combine latest. Uh, combine latest, actually what it does, it takes, it actually combines two streams. Uh, let's call it upstream one and upstream two. And it produces one downstream with a, um, basically a combination of values from both streams. In this case, uh, what combine latest does is uh, it takes the latest value on each um, uh, on each stream and it produces the updated value whenever any change on any change to uh, upstream one or upstream two happens. So in this case, when one uh, when event uh, with number one is emitted, there is still no uh, no um, uh, latest event on stream number two. So once we get uh, the first letter on stream two, then we get our first um, event on the downstream uh, here. So let's actually uh, check uh, the last one that I wanted to show. So there is scan operator. It's, uh, it's actually also uh, pretty useful. Scan is sort of a map function, but um, 
In addition to just taking the value from posted from upstream, uh, what it allows is to get the combination of the previous value uh, on the uh, downstream and combine it with the new value. So for example, if we have um, x plus y, when there is event one posted, there is uh, no initial value, but when there is a number uh, two posted, it takes basically uh, uh, just uh, addition of one plus two, which equals three. Yeah, so there are some states where you can think of, oh, I want to kind of produce, um, um, like for each event, I want to combine it with the previous uh, state, for example, or something like that. Uh, let's actually dive a little bit more in terms of the actual like useful part, which is where you combine um, uh, combine different operators. So, like in terms of uh, like let's let's actually see like we have Swift code, just regular one. Um, you probably uh, like heard uh, something about uh, chaining. So basically, if you want to chain codes, you can uh, write uh, subsequent uh, calls. Uh, for example, on line number four here, I, I just uh, have the operator which checks if the value is uh, null or not. And if it is, then it does something else. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's uh, give you just a little bit more of the uh, chaining example. So in this case, we just have the uh, regular list of uh, numbers and we do some filtering and then uh, mapping. So filter just applies uh, this function and removes uh, basically any element uh, from this array and pushes it to downstream and downstream already maps each value within the uh, provided list uh, to the result right here. Let's actually see how it works with um, uh, combining um, kind of operators. Uh, specifically, I want to kind of uh, ask you to think about a task where you need to um, you you just need to print um, just print a lock print a lock message whenever there is a double click or triple click basically multiple multi click uh, happens so multi touch on iPhone uh, how would you how would you implement it it's uh, kind of uh, not a straightforward task you would probably need to have some timers some state uh, yeah a bunch of different variables uh, thinking about resetting the state etc. Uh, in terms of actually reactive programming, it's a bit much easier. So there are like those functions that I mentioned, operators, you can chain them all together and you can get the result. For example, if we get like um, each event, which is our uh, top upstream, uh, and each event represents just a touch on the screen, uh, we can basically buffer them over time. Uh, for, for example, like we have the um, a 250 millisecond interval and uh, each event within that interval gets into sort of a bucket that is then pushed uh, to downstream. So you can see that uh, here, let's assume there is a 250 uh, milliseconds happens here. So there is one click. Um, here we get uh, two clicks. So we bucket them and we get the set of two, again one, again, uh, and then three. And you can actually then map this result into uh, just different values. So in this case, let's just map to what's the length of the of the bucket. Uh, so that would be one, two, one, and three. And then you just filter it. Filter, uh, in our case, we want multi-click, which means uh, we just need to filter for any um, amount of clicks, which is larger or uh, equal or greater than two. So. Uh, it can be translated to like literally, I don't know, four to six uh, lines of code, depending of course how big, uh, like how, uh, depending on, on your kind of code indentation and other stuff, but um, yeah, just for operators. Uh, let's see why you would probably even consider using uh, reactive programming. So if you're thinking about mobile apps, there is always some uh, kind of trigger, for example, there is a change in text field uh, that results in a save to local database or save to remote. Then there is auto validation of the input and there can be display of their either validation state or some, some changes basically. So there is like a stream of uh, things that happen and uh, yeah, you can, you can like if you could generalize the way you work with the stream, that, that's the ideal kind of uh, thing to 
uh, supporting your code, for example. And the other thing that, uh, that is very, very important is once you actually define those streams, you don't have to think about all possible states that, uh, for example, if you want to um, uh, like display the uh, state changes whenever there is a text field change, like basically you would probably need to call uh, display state whenever there is any uh, change in like any state that affects that uh, UI. But if you align the, the uh, UI updates just as a stream of uh, changes based on the model, the UI would basically get uh, updated automatically. And there is a less chance that you forget to update it in one place or another. So let's uh, move on. Uh, Actually, let's uh, just let, let's see what the Swift combined framework is about. Um, so the like the whole framework consists of uh, three very important uh, components. One is the publisher. Uh, basically, as a publisher, you can think of that stream. So there is something that emits events uh, over time. Uh, there is subscribers. Subscriber is what actually needs those events. Uh, events and what listens to it. And there is uh, something called uh, cancelable. Cancelable just allows you to control when you want to explicitly stop something. Or um, for example, if you have their uh, kind of some service uh, object or manager object in your application and you want to stop uh, some updates when the new controller gets hidden. For example, in that case, there is uh, reference from your view controllers to the cancelable and cancelable basically just handles that subscription. Whenever cancelable and view controller gets uh, removed from memory by the system, the whole uh, subscription will be also stopped. So that's actually very useful and very efficient. <clears throat> uh, let's see actually just some examples of the, um, like how you, how you actually deal with the, uh, with the combined code. So in this code, I just propose you to check the regular way to kind of uh, get, uh, for example, to, to perform URL request. So we have the URL, we have the URL session, uh, we have the completion block, and then we just have the resume call. So another way, another code that you might probably saw uh, in IS code base, there is notification center with the, uh, with the selector definition, basically a function that gets triggered whenever there is a notification posted with this name. Looks kind of a little bit different if I go back and forth between those. But let's see how that would possibly look in uh, Swift combined uh, kind of manner. So there is a Euro session. It has a new function that uh, can create a publisher actually. Uh, it, it's similar definition to what we had uh, previously. Um, uh, just the function declaration is different a little bit and what it returns is actually a publisher that you can subscribe. So in this, in this code here, sync is basically creating a subscription. It's an explicit way to say that, okay, uh, there is a publisher, uh, we want to start observing for values. And at that point, the publisher starts doing some actual work. For example, go to the server, or do, do something else, depending of course on uh, what publisher is that. Uh, as I mentioned, there is a completion of failure. So there is a separate function. Uh, in this case, it's closure that allows you to handle the completion. But in this case, we just handle the received uh, value. Um, you can see that uh, pretty straightforward co code. And uh, the only uh, thing that I want to notice, uh, so there is store in cancelables. Uh, this code is basically uh, responsible for saving that cancelable that I mentioned earlier and allows the um, uh, URL session uh, download task, data task to be stopped when, there is, when this view controller uh, goes out of memory, for example. So some, something to kind of um, remember. Uh, same thing about notification center. We have their uh, subscription, we have the publisher uh, created here. We have the sync method that creates subscription. You can see that the API is same. It's pretty much just the way you create the publisher is different. If I go back and forth, 
but the the way you handle those values it's just the same so basically what swift uh, combine uh, framework allows you is to unify how you work with those uh, streams which is uh, really great um, yeah so let's actually uh, get back to operators because um, so in swift combine operator kind of works as both as a publisher and a subscriber what that means is basically as i mentioned there is um, whenever you attach operator to publisher it actually produces another publisher which i called uh, previously downstream so there is uh, this upstream which is th that original stream and uh, operator just creates a downstream which is some uh, uh, new sets of value published over time um, so let's actually see like what operators are available um, yeah the font is kind of a little bit messed up here but um, so we have uh, multiple categories of operators something to remember about uh, I already mentioned about map scan filter something really good and uh, kind of for uh, more like performance uh, wise you can use uh, remove duplicates you can just allow to ig uh, ignore the event if it's same as the previously one published uh, for example if you have some uh, large task large uh, computation that you need to do and it depends on the uh, on some input and you don't want to recalculate the same thing for the same input then you just ignore those so uh, some of that stuff is git compact map is for example just uh, ignoring the uh, now values and uh, um, and a bunch of other flat map and switch to latest which just works with the there is kind of a higher level abstraction which is um, um, publisher of publishers so you can each event uh, with published within the stream is represented as its own publisher so you can you can actually have like a higher level uh, I would say functions, but in this case, it's higher level of uh, publishers. Uh, there's accumulators, uh, just like regular ones. You can collect uh, um, values and do something with uh, with those uh, partitioners. Just like take first, last, the same as what you do with the list array dictionary. Okay, not with dictionary, but uh, uh, with uh, some ordered uh, collections. Um, and uh, there are some other useful ones, uh, joiners. If you want to, for example, combine uh, two publishers together, um, like I already talked about combine latest, uh, there is a pant and prepant, uh, which are just adding the one publisher in front of another. And uh, there is timers. You can basically control lots of uh, things related to time. Uh, some really good example, for example, the throttle function. Uh, 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 sorry, the throttle operator. It just allows you to easily, um, like if the user types uh, very quickly uh, uh, some text in the, into the text field and you do some search request to their uh, server, what, what you need to do is uh, optimize that um, we don't try to send a request on each uh, typed letter, but instead uh, we would have some uh, time for example 250 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds within which we ignore any uh, inputted uh, text and only after the, that time interval since the last uh, typed letter we would do the actual request so some of the optimizations uh, which are very easily um, uh, addable to to your code base and uh, another thing is error handlers uh, you can do anything with errors you can replace error with the success uh, you can basically retry it just like one api one line of code and that's it uh, some other real world world use cases um, pretty much sign up forms or like any type of forms where you have uh, text fields switches change of state uh, basically like if you for example have a username field that you want like want to check for example there is a registration form and you want to ask the user to enter the username they want to use and you want to be able to report if the same username is already in database uh, used by someone else you can basically um, like easily add uh, swift combine to uh, do first like the throttling part that i mentioned and then there would be just a request to the database and it would uh, 
propagate to some, I don't know, check mark if their username is available or not. So some, some, some use cases which are um, really useful. Uh, there is also like password comparison. You have two text fields. Whenever there is any change to one text, each, each of the text fields, you, you want to uh, display if they are matching or not. So combine latest does like great job with that. Uh, search list, I mentioned about that. Uh, user defaults. Just imagine you probably had something like uh, default currency or default, uh, I don't know, uh, measurement units uh, within the app. And you want basically to just uh, be able, the UI to get adjusted to any change within the user default. So that's something that uh, Swift Combine allows uh, with the, some extra additions. Um, Based on the current SDK, the user defaults do not have the publisher, but there is a publisher available uh, as like kind of open source uh, extension for the Swift Combine. And it just allows you to reactively, basically react to any changes in user defaults from your U UI, which is uh, less bugs and less things for you to handle. Uh, of course, I didn't mention that, but there is a really nice integration with MVVM. Uh, you don't need to have your own observable uh, implementations. It's just out of the box. It works good. It's stable. It's supported by the um, Apple uh, within like different frameworks. So some some other like things I, I want to talk over, uh, like pros and cons. So what's good about Combine is basically smaller code size. Uh, as I mentioned, those operators are working great. And uh, I would assume that uh, in regular case, you would probably spend more time writing uh, code to support a certain use case. Another thing is, um, yeah, lots of operators out of the box. Those th th that I listed, they are not actually covering um, uh, the whole specter of what's available. I think it's maybe like 40 or 50% of what, what's actually available. Um, less surface for bugs. Just imagine if you have multiple states and you want to have combined state, which is just a result of like other things. So that's where you have um, just combining the stream of updates into uh, like one specific result value. You can think about it. Um, for example, I want to go for a walk uh, in case there is nice weather and there is uh, warm temperature. So two conditions that I have as an input and one result as I have uh, one, one output as a result. So if any of the condition changes, the result also changes. So that's the same thing with the combine. You, it, but you get that uh, kind of automatically once you define that relationship. Uh, you probably heard about callback how, like in case uh, you have uh, lots of completion blocks, uh, closures uh, embedded into each other. You can have that at some point, just a very kind of long strings, uh, long um, codes that takes, I don't know, 160, 200 uh, characters uh, in each line. And uh, of course that's with the spaces, but yeah, uh, with the combined because of the, uh, because of its asyn asynchronous nature, you kind of define it um, linearly so you just attach uh, handlers uh, in the next uh, in the chain basically I, I think i showed that and the last uh, uh, thing is basically uh, just to remind there's unified api uh, regarding some of the downsides learning cur curve it's it's not very easy to understand like how the reactive uh, uh, like to, to kind of grasp all the reactive uh, programming um, kind of patterns and um, yeah, so that takes time, but uh, like if you get it and if you help your team to kind of grow in understanding that, uh, that kind of pays off. And there is a debugging complexity, another thing, um, because of that uh, asynchronous nature and lots of callbacks, uh, not, not callbacks, but operators, you might see the call stack uh, kind of grow. So you need to be uh, either efficient in how you analyze that, or you need to basically know how to filter the call stack for what you're looking for. I think that covers most of it. I just want to give some uh, credits uh, for the uh, material that was really helping. I, I, I totally recommend each of 
uh, those um, you can find uh, those articles on the internet they are available there is one video from the WWDC also very helpful and I think that's pretty much it that's pretty much it yeah thanks everyone fantastic well thank you so much uh, any, any questions with that very thorough I, I have a question it's pretty great yeah uh, yeah so first of all uh, my name is Fernando I I use it to work with like native iOS development one year and a half ago. And after that, I changed it to Flutter. And it, with Flutter, you basically follow a declarative programming style. And I had to learn a lot of those like RX start and controllers, string controllers and all those kind of stuff similar to, to Combine. So my question is, do you think that it's like a natural path for you to move to Swift to Y? I don't know if you have ever try it, uh, if it works well with MVVM. Uh, sorry, to move to watch, can you, can you say it again? To Swift UI. Oh, Swift UI. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say that at some point, uh, it might be a good idea. Or at this point, uh, like, for example, at my current company, um, I still think that the uh, Swift UI is not really good with uh, handling the navigation uh, use cases, specifically transitioning between different screens, and uh, especially if it's kind of non-linear transition, just not uh, like going back and forth, but more like switching between different contexts. That's where the Swift UI kind of lags behind, and I think uh, that's where they kind of need to improve first. Um, but I think that um, some of the kind of declarative uh, part of it so that allows you just to kind of uh, define the view templates and just reuse it, uh, kind of just build, uh, build components uh, that you then you reuse uh, as part of Swift UI. Then it's, it's great. But uh, I, I think you can use, uh, for example, Swift combined with or without Swift UI. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, basically, um, as I said, building those uh, flows that you want to uh, kind of basically basically building those flows that define the business logic, like how it should uh, how it should handle like certain cases, how it should uh, react, and how it should propagate down the application state up up to their uh, UI layer. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I hope that's the answer for your question. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and the idea of the combined framework is to kind of like replace uh, RX Swift. Uh, yeah, so uh, for for that, I would say that uh, RX Swift uh, it doesn't have uh, a good notion of the back pressure. For example, like if you get uh, too many too much events that the subscriber cannot handle, uh, like the subscriber for Swift combined, it it actually it can um, request how many values it wants to receive. Where with Rx Swift, it's Rx Swift. It's kind of uh, less um, um, less thought through uh, during the design uh, part. I think for the uh, for the uh, library, I didn't have uh, that much experience specifically with Rx Swift. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, my uh, background is mostly working with the Reactive Swift and Reactive Coca. Um, yeah, but that's something that I heard about and uh, yeah, and it's actually um, one good uh, one good thing about uh, Swift Combine, as I mentioned, is that it's available starting from iOS 13, like on any device, so you don't need a dependency, basically third party dependency and it's same as with the, like any other framework you, you use on iOS. You, it's not something you need to get like approval from legal team or something. So it's just available. So it's just a matter of getting the minimum target for your application to S13 and being able to use it. Do you know of any third parties that are using it yet? Uh, sorry, can you, can you ask it again? Do you know of, of any third party libraries that are using it yet? Uh, third party libraries. Um, I don't think I, oh, okay. Uh, I actually know there, there are some extensions for Realm, for example, uh, that allow you to get the stream of uh, uh, your database objects uh, whenever there is any change. I know there, there are some open source kind of GIS available on GitHub for, for example, core data, um, some helpers for like user defaults that allow publisher, but 
some kind of libraries that are heavily depend on that. I don't think uh, I, I know that many. Um, yeah, but like I don't see uh, why many other libraries should depend on Swift Combine. So just a matter of like, if it's something that just displays, like l there are lots of uh, UI libraries and uh, UI libraries, they just need to kind of uh, get that input state. So we can bind that uh, through Swift Combine. Uh, something that produces basically usually like the heavy logic is to align those events and kind of combine them all together so that's more like a business logic so i'm thinking about uh, benefits in terms of just aligning uh, that flow of data and making sure that it matches what the, what are your business requirements uh, yeah in terms of third third party probably it will it might come like more popular among open source projects, but yeah, it's kind of mostly just uh, supported um, by Apple, I would say. Cool. Hi, Lena. Uh, this is Jason. I think, thank you. That was a great presentation. My question is, have you used Combine with Core Data? I play around with it in the fall and I didn't really find there was um, really a smooth integration. Do you have any experience in that area? So yeah, actually, um, so just to kind of give a little bit introduction about uh, what I work on specifically. So uh, as I mentioned, I work at Riven. Um, we just opened office like pretty much end of uh, last year. I joined uh, January this year, the, the company, but I worked with a bunch of guys from Intel uh, there. So I kind of uh, know what's going on. And so, um, we do use the core data as part of our stack. Uh, there is actually a publisher available for uh, core data. It's kind of uh, more like a GIST available on their internet. I think I even saw like some Medium articles about it. Uh, we just recently um, uh, kind of worked on the integration part of that. It uh, does work and uh, you basically get the uh, uh, events with your objects uh, from the core data. Um, uh, stack and uh, yeah, the, I found some uh, kind of bugs with it, but uh, most of most of the issues could be handled. There is uh, kind of um, there is some uh, crash with the um, whenever you try to uh, add uh, error handler, specifically the catch try uh, block, but uh, that wasn't like a huge uh, deal for us. Uh, yeah, and everything else seems to work fine. We have actually like. Um, you can think of our code base as a combination of the local uh, local store events, which are those uh, core data objects and a set of information that we get from the cloud. And we basically just have a stream combined uh, from both the core data and from the cloud. So we first uh, just get the stream from the local store. We do the request right away. Whenever there is any updated data, we uh, display it. it 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 actually plays nicely yeah great thank you well very very cool any last questions guys ladies and gentlemen um yeah i have a quick question um i was wondering uh like so swift ui and uh, combine came out at the same time uh last last wwc um and uh, playing with swift ui uh, and to combine uh, combine to a lesser extent uh swift ui is pretty rough still like uh, it's lots of uh Things that don't quite work um, and or are incomplete. Um, how's your experience with Combine in that regard? Have you run into into bugs, um, or does it feel pretty rock solid? Uh, I would say uh, we didn't see too many bugs, but some of the features that I'm missing, um, specifically, for example, um, there is uh, something called so there is like uh, Swift uh, five uh, one introduced those uh, property wrappers. That are placed uh, that are kind of playing nicely with the rest of the code and specifically Swift Combine. But uh, some of the things that I noticed, for example, like if you want to have uh, kind of interfaces between service layer and, uh, for example, view model or some other uh, services, uh, using those property wrappers like published property. They are not very nice, nicely marked. Specifically, you cannot use property wrapper in the protocol. So that's one thing. Another thing that I can think of is, um, for example, the uh, um, kind of uh, 
a property wrapper for current values object. So, so there is published and there is current values objects. Published actually uh, is kind of, um, it's a property wrapper that allows to publish notifications prior to any change to the property, which is kind of what Swift UI needs. But uh, there is uh, a need like specifically in our, in our application to get the updates after the change happens. So yeah, for, for that thing, we have to just like use, uh, for example, current uh, value subject, uh, which doesn't have a nice property wrapper. We had our own implementation for that. So that's that would be nice to have as part of the kind of uh, library itself. Uh, some other downsides that I'm thinking of is um, uh, just the kind of um, um, access layer to those publishers. So for example, if you declare like a publisher, then the interface allows any uh, outer object to like push events, for example, or something like that. So some of those like basic things uh, are still kind of uh, missing in the framework itself. Um, but overall, I think it's still really useful because as I said, the strength is in the operators that you can chain together and you, you can basically align to like different uh, use cases. And as I said, uh, the whole thing about it is, it's actually like a good practice of functional programming where you have kind of a stateless uh, functions that just take input and produce output. So like where possible, it uh, leads to just reduced amount of bugs. So I think it's, it's kind of a nice thing. Uh, and I think uh, the like, Apple is going to, introduce some like new functionality to that and going to support it better. So I kind of, uh, yeah, I would say that it's, uh, it's something that you probably uh, would at least take a look at it, see like if, if you like it and uh, I would say just try it out, maybe just play around with it and play around. It's, it works nicely there too, so. I hope that answers your question. Well, very, 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 very cool. And thank you so much for sharing. Definitely well prepared. Um, so um, why don't you take, uh, um, Aaron, I guess you can take the conch at this point. Um, but I, I, I thank you. Um, and I gotta say, just before Aaron starts, uh, it's so nice to see everyone's faces here. Like this feels right, you know? So those who are, who, are, who, are, who have the screen closed, like, you know, when I see Henrik all of a sudden and all that, I'm like, Hey, it's Henry. I didn't know that. It's nice to see you guys. That's that's all I want to say off that bat. You know, I'm not saying don't start showing yourselves. You know, if you're all of a sudden, you know, half half uh, uh, shirts off and all that, that's cool. You know, you, it's pajama mode still. But uh, all the same, it just feels right. So I want to thank you guys for all showing up. Um, so again, Leonard, thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to start by saying I'm really excited about having Aaron speak. Aaron. Um, is someone who's always impressed me. Um, I've known Aaron for, God, it's got to be close to 10 years now, um, through this meetup group, which says, which says a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, since moving to Japan, it's been a little bit difficult for you to, to share with us uh, all the cool stuff you're pushing. So um, thank you for, for taking the time. I'm sure it's breakfast for you right now, but uh, I'm excited to hear what you can share. So please take the conch and uh, have a bad at it. All right, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Oh my gosh, uh, good memories. Um, I do miss Vancouver a lot. Um, it is, it's kind of its own thing, like coming to another country and then like not being able to speak the language very well, you really feel it after a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> it's like, I just want a conversation. So I guess actually, you know, kind of everyone's in, you know, the same, you know, situation like working from home. <laughs> you, can't, you just can't talk to someone when you really want to. But um, this is really great. Thank you, Chris, for inviting me. And uh, it's, it's my opportunity to reconnect with people. And, and uh, this is a wonderful community. So, um, okay, so I will uh, share my screen, I guess. Let's see, I want to share the other screen. Yeah, that one. Share. Allow Zoom to share your screen. While you're trying to figure that out, Aaron, I just gotta say I've seen lots of pictures you, with you with Shuji, who of course I know as well from here, and he yeah. speaks English, but it's like a game of guess of what every third word is he says. So I understand where you're coming. From. He speaks. He doesn't speak Japanese or English. He speaks Shuji. 
That's a joke. <laughs> He's a great guy, though, I gotta say. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Do we see my screen? Uh, yeah? We are good. Yeah, we're good? We got, we, got screen, we got a live screen here. Oh, I see this bar thingy is, you, you don't see the thumbnail bar, do you? No, you're all good. Just the okay. screen. Cool, cool. Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, this, is, this presentation is a little bit of a, um, more about the history of Monocle than necessarily Monocle itself. Um, I've been working on this 3D scanning technology uh, since April 2nd, 2015. So we've just had our five year anniversary of working on this thing. Um, and the original commit was head scanner. <laughs> uh, and we scanned a bunch of boxes. <laughs> Uh, I've got uh, like uh, over a thousand models now on the database um, and uh, and growing and and yeah but um, really this talk is about what took so long. <laughs> um, so right around the time that I put Monocle together uh, uh, I was also really getting involved with VR stuff <laughs> like over here it's like Emily Carr um, or no, actually that was at the sawmill. I uh, got suited up and made a funny face. Um, also kicked off some Van VR uh, action. And uh, thank you to a lot of people who joined from uh, Vidya. Um, that, was, that was really great. Uh, and it was a great scoop to have Emily Carr support uh, Van VR and, and grow that whole thing. Anyways, uh, during that time, of course, you know, I was trying it out, scanning a bunch of people and uh, trying to make uh, uh, an app and a system and, and everything. And uh, here's yours, your uh, Chris Hobbs, truly. Uh, you can scan this with your phone and, and uh, have a look at that 3D model from way back when. I remember the doing results. that, it blew me away. <laughs> <laughs> the results are not bad for like way back when. Well, it looks a little like David, but it's still pretty good. <laughs> For those who don't Actually, know that. Yeah. Who, which one is it? <laughs> Maybe you're right. Maybe that's David. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so uh, it's, it was like kind of a amazing timing that Apple launched ARKit uh, at WWDC June 26, 2017. Uh, it just put a lot more uh, emphasis behind what I was wanting to do with uh, with Monocle at the at the time. I called it selfie scanner. Selfies were all the rage, um, but uh, it it really just put a lot of fire, a lot of uh, like like oh my god, this is what I got to do. Um, but also, I was helping coordinate the cube and. Uh, had to design the space, figure out the security and all that crap while I was trying to build my other company, Steampunk Digital. Um, and I also had a lot of contracting work, which was super interesting. So I was working on mixed reality with uh, Occipital, uh, got invited into their core team to, to build the technology um, and uh, all the interfaces and Unity and uh, making it work on an iPhone 6S, believe it or not. Um, and in this case, I was kind of demonstrating like interaction of the real world. So detection that this book is open and closed in real time directly from the video feed. Um, and and that, was, that was just, you know, one of the pieces of technology that I got to build for a showcase called a Wavana um, that never really showed, which was really sad. But um, we pushed the boundaries on um, point cloud rendering on a mobile device. And we pushed the boundaries on a volumetric rendering and 4K uh, 360 video replay on an iPhone. It was actually, I got an iPhone 10 at that time. Uh, and it was just like, oh my God, this thing can haul. Uh, for render horsepower um, and doing all the slam tracking and everything. Um, super interesting. Got to do more 
with the mixed reality tech. Anyways, just way too interesting. But there's a problem with that. Um, what about Monocle? <laughs> All this time, I actually had some help, uh, development help with the uh, Monocle server development. So we, we built out the whole Monocle D3 server stack. Uh, I had an employee called Randy uh, Willander, and he was amazing. He, he helped build so much of this stack. It was fully unit tested. We had a whole account signup system, upload sync was working, subscription purchasing, a whole gallery is working. Everything was looking pretty good in terms of like tech, this tech stack. Um, except for one nasty thing that happened. The server, around September 2018, uh, the prototype server got hacked. I mean, like, whatever, like security issues around like, okay, how do they get in and stuff? It's gonna happen. But I learned a lot of things about building server stacks. And one of them is that you gotta make the, the system debuggable uh, in so many ways. And this was a tough one to, to figure out. And on top of that, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking, no problem, we will rebuild, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like okay earthquake happened a chair fell over like come on it's not a big deal okay got a little bit of hack whatever but right around this time i was moving to japan <laughs> you know trying to figure out where to live and i was still trying to like make the monocle like usdz thing work and uh you know it's still doing contracting work and i had to survive because, oh my God, I'm in Japan. And yeah, like I gotta make, I gotta survive. And I gotta like figure out who to talk to and how to, how to like get established. So established I did. Uh, I got the Steampunk Digital Co Limited registered. It's a proper Japanese entity. Uh, it's just like in Canada, just, you know. Uh, we got our office. Um, we, you know, finding an office space and, and then like renewing my visa so that I have a business manager visa, which applies for all the startup perks. Um, uh, I got to meet up with tons of more people, um, just, just networking like crazy, like these events, Avidia was super valuable uh, in Japan. Uh, so uh, this is a global game jam and also working at WeWork, I got to like meet up with so many people. Um, and also just like being able to pair up with like uh, these guys who were doing a Kickstarter for like a men's kimono. And, you know, we did some scanning and demonstration of like how to like show the stuff off on the web. And uh, one thing led to another and uh, our office rent got quartered like 125th the price. Um, I teamed up with another company, Takasan of Builders, we both needed office space and I both, you know, I really wanted to work with him uh, on stuff and we thought, yeah, let's team up. And so we, we actually also qualified for a uh, 50% um, subsidy from this, uh, this startup center, this LSI incubation space. So we got like a huge office and we got to like, totally pimp it out with like 3D printers and like ridiculous TVs that look like a helmet. And <laughs> we just got to have fun. Um, but one thing led to another and you know, we, we won an award. It was like, this is like the South by Southwest of Japan, um, Wakaru Summit. And, uh, and we got an award from Thailand for our technology. And also we got our bank financing. And I have to say, this is the moment when I could properly focus on Monocle server stuff and Monocle's deployment and finish off the app because I'm financed. I can just focus on this tech and get it out. But also it just happened to be around this time, we actually launched it, <laughs> but we, we pivoted the, the app. So Monocle 3D Scanner is on the app store right now. We made it so it's standalone and you can just use this with a structure sensor uh, like one of these guys. And uh, 
you can you, you can use it to do your basic scanning and uh, there's an in-app purchase for the v3 features and um, so like some of the export options and quality settings and stuff uh, and so you can produce your own 3d models and host them however you like anyways really great got it launched yahoo um, and now i've been able to just refocus on the server stack again and oh my god what happened to the internet <laughs> everything that i had built with got overhauled i mean everything like uh all the all the tech that i was like that i touched uh everything got expired basically everything is, is like i had to do major version jumps on so many of the modules and so i was like well if I got to like rebuild some stuff anyways, like why don't I think serverless? And so no kidding, like in the last four months, all the critical technologies went live, like the emulators and the TypeScript support and everything got really good. Uh, and so now I can unqualify or like my unqualified opinion is to say, this is like the way to go because I can now build to scale up and rely on the strengths of giants to, to deal with the server. And it's just in time. And I'm so grateful that this technology has matured in this way. Um, and so like, yeah, everything is much tighter in terms of end to end programming. And it's so crazy that now my Swift data structures and data storage and the deserialization and serialization uh, mechanics with this new Swift 5, um, like codable uh, classes or structures are, are, it just makes it so easy to pull the data in and out, store it against your Firebase storage or your Firestore storage and, and decode it and then like put it back out. And then the server side, uh, I'm using TypeScript and the storage, uh, the uh, database uh, uh, data structures now map really nicely. And so the, the, the TypeScript and the Swift looks almost identical. And that data is fully validated and it's, it's pumping in and out of the database. It's a whole other topic uh, to talk about, but it's, it's really great that that works because now I can build so fast. There's so many of the functions that were just rebuilt in uh, weeks instead of months. Um, and, uh, and it just, yeah, now I've, I'm actually testing the new server infrastructure and you'll see that today. So uh, let's, uh, let's just do a quick uh, scan here. So I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, let's bring this up. Uh -oh. Come on, I need you to go on the other screen. Uh oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> So you can see uh, my screen mirror. Can you guys see my screen mirror? Yes. Is it up? Okay. Okay. So uh, I will. So here's here's Monocle. Here's Monocle Cloud. Uh, this is this is live data sync. Up. Oh, sorry, I got like random notes coming. <laughs> um, Uh, also, let me just fire this up over here. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you can see my iPad, you can see my iPhone. Okay, now uh, I'm going to do a little scan here. Set this up for a sec here. No, actually, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> Okay, so 
Here is the subject I want to scan. Oh, <laughs> I guess I guess I didn't uh, establish the ground plane properly. Here. It's busy processing. There we go. There's the object. Okay, great. Now I want to save that off and upload that to the server. Uh, it's, okay, so it's now syncing up on both the iPad and the phone and is processing that server side. And as soon as it's done, you'll see it, yeah, go live. Okay, so now I can just say, uh, I can say it was Japanese. Japanese. Oh, okay, okay, okay. If not. Turn on sharing, save that. The state is replicated. So you'll notice that both the phone and the iPad have synced their state and also the original uh, internal scan data. It's all, all replicated everywhere. And thank you, reactive design principles made all of this really easy. So er I'm really using like Promise Kit and RX Swift. Um, and RX uh, Relay to help like make all this work really well. And now you can scan that barcode and load that on your iPhone. Now we don't have the US, oh, actually the USB-Z viewing is working, I think. So for example, if I just look at that, click in the link. This is like a little prototype viewer. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty like eh, just kind of in development. It's very, it's very early, like last week, <laughs> just getting this thing put together. And I'm working on this to, to improve it. Freaking cool, Aaron. It's, it's still loading. Why is it taking so long? Okay, there we go. Okay, so I can now open the USB-Z here, pop that on the desk. That's now the new USB-Z. Well, I know why it's taking so long. I have it set on like maximum settings. So it's probably a pretty big file. Yeah. So there we go. That's the AR kit render. There's the original. So <laughs> yeah, so copy paste reality works. <laughs> I should totally put this on the new iPad. Anyway. That's so cool. Yeah, so that's it. That's my demo. Monocle V3 server stuff is going live pretty soon. Um, and, uh, and I hope to share that with everybody soon. And uh, so thanks for, thanks for watching and thanks for hearing my story. <laughs> wow. Any questions on, on that? That's really cool. Does that, does that export? Can you export it to like a step file or something that can be read in CAD as well? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I can export to um, the app. Well, currently in the App Store, can actually export uh, OBJ, uh, a GLB. So you can put that into like lots of the web renderers and stuff. Uh, 
or STL. So you can pull that into like Mesh Mixer or whatever and clean it up and uh, make it printable. Wow, that's amazing. Like uh, I, I work in the electric car business and sometimes when we scan things like suspension parts, that takes, like you have to get somebody to come, you have to hire all the equipment and just do what, just what you showed, just to be able to share it, that, scan it and share it that quickly, that is amazing. <laughs> You mean you can uh, print it on 3D printer using this file? Yes, you can, yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah and it's scale accurate, uh, plus or minus about, so for the size of a head, anyways, I measured it to be uh, about 1.8 millimeters uh, precision, um, or uh, like 95% like, uh, out confidence. So oh. um, wow. yeah, so it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. That's the first uh, step to teleportation. So you can basically get objects in one place and just send it to the other place. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's so crazy, like I'm following the latest research on this stuff and um, uh, there's some new, new methods of reconstruction using neural networks that uh, I'm investigating and it's just mind blowing where this technology is about to go. So off of a single photo that I segment out, like if I, I cause I can get the depth information. If I segment out your silhouette or just using the machine learning model of a person, I can segment out your likeness from the background then throw that at uh, some of the, the software, some of the uh, like deep neural nets. You can reconstruct in full 3D, including the backside. It hallucinates the backside of the person uh, or of that object. And uh, it's, it's, it's getting amazing, like what's possible. <laughs> so, so each time it scans more objects, it gets uh, smarter and makes it, makes it better each time? I wish it was like that, but it's more like it, you can just kind of add data to the pool. And I've got it like over a thousand objects in it of 3D objects that I can train a neural network with, but it takes a lot of time to like reprocess the, the neural weights. But what you get is uh, a pretty trained network, like pretty good trained network on reconstructing, uh, like estimating the size and look, including the far side look of, of a subject. Um, even if it was just with one photo. But what's really awesome about some of this stuff is that it's, it's able to compose multiple and synthesize that to enhance the resolution and quality from arbitrary angles and shooting directions and stuff. So, so I'm gonna be using that probably in the later stage of the processing online and, uh, and Monocle is gonna get like way better, way better results uh, just off of ordinary camera phones, um, but then we have the true depth camera and we can train the neural network with depth so that we get uh, scale accuracy, like super enhanced. So things are gonna get really good, really fast. Have you had much experience where you take something and you um, scale it up uh, to twice its size and do you see any kind of artifacts from that or is it, is it pretty much? Oh you know, yeah, there's tons of artifacts that are there. Um, mm -hmm. The quality is all kind of relative, right? Um, I want to make this like the Kodak box camera of convenience so you can just kind of shoot and scan things. Um, the, uh, the reality, like uh, using uh, photogrammetry software like Reality Capture can give spectacularly better quality results. And we're actually doing that with uh, the uh, Fukuoka Museum, right? We're doing a project with them um, doing some uh, photogrammetry reconstruction. Uh, but thankfully, uh, we did our scan um, with uh, Monocle as well as the photogrammetry because I, I wanted a scale reference, like a scale accuracy reference. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really handy. But uh, also, thank goodness, because uh, some of the photogrammetry didn't work out. Um, so this is the guessing game you play with photogrammetry. If it doesn't work out, you can be totally screwed because you can't go back and reshoot that, that thing. Uh, in this case, because it's all curated, they brought like treasures of Japan out for me to shoot and uh, there was no option. So we used the scan reference um, for some of the geometry in filling and that was good enough. We just had to register a few of the photos uh, back to 
to fill in the the color on the uh, the uh, other sides um but we didn't but some of it just kind of got totally mashed which is unfortunate so that's what you get with photogrammetry it's a get it's a guessing game so i hope to improve all that <laughs> i'm just glad you didn't use my head <laughs> No mashing of Chris's head or <laughs> David's head. <laughs> Whatever, David's fine. Um, any questions, uh, thoughts, anything, guys? Yeah, actually, I have a question. So, um, have you tried to investigate uh, scanning like moving objects? So, basically, I'm just thinking, uh, for example, just think about the um, uh, Microsoft HoloLens uh, second version. Just thinking, like, is, would it be possible to integrate that technology? with the, some sort of a video conferencing in AR, something like that? Oh, I wish I had my HoloLens here to show you. <laughs> I'm mean, just back at the office. Um, the, uh, yeah, I really, really hope so um, to be able to just scan by looking at things and just gesturing with your hands to just like scan that and just like have it automatically segment and like target that thing and scan. Uh, or you know, do the reconstruction of it. Um, I've been researching uh, some of the more like advanced uh, reconstruction methods. And one of the coolest ones was a Chinese team. Um, There's like Beijing University that do uh, real time uh, 3D mapping of moving subjects that are like, like it actually gains data as you move around and is continuously tracking the subject, the object, and it's arbitrary. It doesn't have to be human skeleton. It can be just like, with a really impressive one was they opened a backpack right up and closed it and kept scanning. And it totally understood those contact surfaces of it coming back together again and, and maintained the 3D, the canonical model and everything about what it's, what's flexing and so it maps all that information dynamically, which is super cool. The only thing is the approach that they took is it requires CUDA running on a really high end GTX 1080 Ti, um, at the, you know, for the time. Um, and it's, you know, heavy desktop equipment to do that processing. Uh, but it was doing it in real time, which was really cool. So uh, I'm paying attention to some of the latest cutting edge research. Unfortunately, most of the stacks that these guys choose to use is like Python or some other thing, and you just can't, it doesn't translate over to iOS. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's researchy uh, coding, which means it's a mess. <laughs> it's not built to engineering standards you need to deploy an app with. So basically the whole thing needs to be rewritten anyways. So I'm hoping to go down that path someday when I get enough bandwidth. <laughs> so in the meantime, I hope to have like a good success with the scanning technology that I have right now, and then keep chugging away on the research as soon as I can. Thanks. Could take another five years. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, it's too cool. <laughs> yeah. Who's the, who's the target uh, the kind of customers are you uh, aiming this for? Is it like you mentioned a uh, museum? Is that the type of company? Um, it's definitely gotten the foot in the door for the museums, but uh, for archival purposes, uh, museums do, don't mind investing in, you know, more hardcore technologies and things. Like the space that we scanned in with the museum was, uh, <laughs> gantries of lighting and like special e like equipment for like the just the power delivery to the lights it was just crazy anyways um they they have a way different level uh uh and i hope that monocle will get there someday and that's actually why we did the photogrammetry with a mobile phone as a self-test of could we do it um and Actually, a lot of the, the work did work. It can do it. Um, but yeah, we definitely had to, there's a lot with photogrammetry software that needs to evolve there. Monocle itself is really targeted at um, uh, the tons and tons of use cases of everyday things that you want to scan. 
So like scanning your furniture, finding out if that furniture will fit. Uh, like if you go off to an Ikea or something, you can go, or, or to a used, uh, used furniture shops are, are like an ideal space where you just go map that thing and then you can check if it's gonna fit at home or vice versa, you map your home and see if you know, that fridge will fit uh, in that space. Those are the use cases I really hope um, Monocle will be able to fulfill. Um, and, uh, and the other one is like uh, photographers that just want to do the on the, fly, on the go scanning. Like it's just one of the tools in their, in their bag uh, where they could just pull this thing out, do a good quality scan of a person, of their likeness, and then offer them a 3D print of, of their likeness. And so they can get like a little figurine character and they can verify on site, yep, that was a good scan. And all it takes is like their cell phone with a, with a scanning, you know, a 3D camera, like the structure sensor. Right. Those, are, those are kind of the ideal use cases. Um, when it comes to like bigger workflows, um, uh, then you start to have to use other technologies. Yeah. Will the new LIDARs that are coming out help doing this too? You mean like this guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really hoping that Apple opens up the depth API for this. Uh, and it's not really that you can get a good reconstruction directly from this, but your tracking is spectacularly good. So combining this technology with uh, some of the neural network uh, uh, techniques, um, enables me to get a very accurate understanding of the camera's position, a rough understanding of the depth map, which helps with understanding scale and scale reference. Combine that with the color map and the neural network and you can infer the geometry at an exceedingly high detail level. Um, it's just, it's all about fusion of sensors and fusion of sensor uh, inputs. And I really hope that Apple gives me that raw data. Right now, the best I've got is, uh, like I can show you um, a little prototype. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Let me just share my screen or just I'll share. Yeah, here you can, so you can see, uh, I'm just mapping my room. So this is just kind of hijacking Apple's um, debug or the uh, mesh anchor system to map out all the surfaces. And it's pretty good. It's, it's about as fast as the meshing that we were doing with um, Bridge Engine. Uh, so this is actually, this is going to be a good alternative to Bridge Engine. Bridge Engine is dead, by the way, unfortunately. Apple changed too much of the API. Um, and, you know, it's obsoleted OpenGL stuff. But now, like, boom, I've got all the stuff I need to make the equivalent of Bridge Engine, which is awesome. Hmm. Um, so yeah, this, this is built just by walking around the room and mapping it all in. And this has huge utility cases for, you know, checking if something is going to fit your living room or not. Um, to identify where things should go or to recover. So actually reinitializing, relocalizing works very well with ARKit now. Better than anything else right now. Like seriously, <laughs> better than everything. They've, they've nailed relocalization. All right, I could save the roadmap. Um, this. And uh, I just spat out a USDZ. I seem to be the only guy that figured out how to save USDZs <laughs> properly. <laughs> the, the, the secret is look at scene kit. It's got more power than you think. <laughs> Excellent.
Well, thanks. Is anything else? No? Blown away by all of these great speakers. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, Sean, uh, Leonard, uh, Aaron, uh, Alexi. Awesome. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for making this online experience such an experience. You know, this, this went much better than I thought it was going to. I thought I, thought I was going to be unplugging and just crying under my desk. So I thank you all for, 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 for making this so wonderful. Um, I have to thank uh, Mr. Mitchell there and Pauline for, for making sure this event takes place um, and, you know, getting all everything uh, structurally working and I appreciate it. And uh, like I said, it's just honestly, it's, it's very heart, heart warming to see everyone here. So I, I thank you for, 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 for taking your time tonight to, or this morning for Aaron in the future um, for, for, for being part of this. And I, I'll definitely be, uh, you know, should this lockdown continue? We're hoping it isn't, and, uh, um, but all the same, let's keep doing this because uh, I, th I think there's a lot of value here, okay? So we need, but we need more speakers, that means, so I will be bugging you. Um, but, but everyone, thank you so much. Um, I wish I could just open it up and, and, you know, people could talk and everything, but my kids will kill me if I don't go home. I've actually been at the office since 5.15 this morning, and they are going to kill me. This is my third day straight, so I got to go see them. It's my daughter's 14th birthday tomorrow. Um, so thank you guys. Um, any, any thoughts on the thing, uh, before we, uh, um, go to bed for old men like me? That's great. Thanks. This is great. Awesome. Talk great well. Excellent. Yeah, for organizing. Hey, no, that was the easy part. No, thanks for, for showing up and making it so great guys. Um, honestly. So let's do this again. And I am about to hit adios. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.